Hello, folks. Welcome to this week's episode of Catholic Recon Testimonies from Reverts and Converts. Before I get into the episode, I want to remind you to subscribe to my channel. We're just getting this off the ground. I think we're on episode 10 now, and I would love the support if possible. And if you know anyone that would love to share a testimony, send them to my website, eddietrask.com. Today's guests are Johnny and Larissa Horn. Welcome. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Um, so Johnny and Larissa are directors of youth ministry at St. John the Evangelist Cathedral in downtown Boise. In addition to that, Larissa is a director of campus ministry at Bishop Kelly and also does life coaching alongside Sterling, who was featured on this channel um, just about a week ago. Johnny helps run a family business. He helps run the men's conference that I was a part of. He and, and Travis do an exceptional job getting that thing off the ground. I think there, it was in its sixth year. Um, is that right, Johnny? This, that's correct. This yeah, we just rolled over our sixth year. Wow, that's incredible. Um, so clearly, all those things going on, you have seven kids in addition to all of that? Doing yes. Doing a remarkable job, <laughs> staying busy. Um, it's just a pleasure to have another couple on the show. Seriously, um, it's, it's a pleasure. So with that, the floor is yours, guys. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you, Eddie. Thank you for having us on. And it's been great kind of getting to know you and your family as well. And we're excited about this ministry that you are starting up. So oh, thank you. Thank you. Way to go. Thank you. Um, gosh, truly, what an honor to be to be invited on your show. And I think that for Johnny and I, I mean, we both were, you know, born into Catholic families. And uh, so, you know, baptized as babies and, and all of that. But the beautiful thing about our Catholic faith is that conversion isn't just a one time, like one and done moment. And I know that Johnny and I both can speak to the fact that we've had many conversions and reversions in our life that have been super powerful. For me, I just kind of a short little thing. I was, you know, part of a, you know, Catholic family, baptized, got my sacraments, first communion, all of that. Um, but when I hit middle school age, high school, early high school, I really started to struggle in my faith. I think like a lot of teenagers do. And uh, I found mass to be completely boring, totally irrelevant to my life. Uh, I felt like God was maybe a million miles away. I didn't think about God. I didn't pray. Um, I s really doubted him. I felt like Jesus was someone that was like a historical figure, somebody that lived 2,000 years ago. I certainly didn't have a relationship with him. And um, I, you know, I kind of thought of him as like Abraham Lincoln or something, like just a, a good man that lived a long time ago but really he had no impact in my day-to-day -day life, not with my friends, with the things that were important to me. And I remember my parents signing me up as a sophomore in high school to be confirmed. And I was really angry about it. I was like, no, I don't wanna go, I don't wanna be confirmed. I don't wanna go through the boring classes with a bunch of students I don't know. Uh, and I went to my dad, I actually sat down with him one evening, I was adamant that I didn't want to be confirmed. And I very strongly said to him, Dad, I'm sorry. Not only do I not want to be confirmed, but when I graduate from high school, I don't ever want to step foot in the Catholic Church again. Um, yeah, it was strong. I just felt like the church had nothing to offer me. And I was really struggling trying to figure out who I was as a young woman, what I wanted. I was really looking to the world to try to find my identity as a young woman, looking to celebrities and uh, people in the media, all of that. And I wanted, I knew I wanted to be a strong, vibrant, young woman who was going to go out and change the world. But I really didn't think that I needed God in my life to do that. And so my dad and his great love and his profound wisdom, he didn't get mad. He just was really calm. Uh, but my dad was also kind of going through a pretty profound conversion or reversion in his own life, a lot in part due to our blessed mother. And I didn't know it at the time, but uh, Mary was really doing some extraordinary things in his life. And so he 
asked, he told me, he said, Larissa, I want you to take the confirmation classes, go to the classes. And if at the end of them, if you don't want to be confirmed, we will not force you to do it, but we want you to make an educated decision. And, and he said, and then in the meantime, I want you to read this book about our blessed mother. And I remember feeling so irritated, like, oh, he's going to make me take the classes. And now he wants me to read some book that I don't even want to read. You know, I just like had that typical teenage attitude. But he gave me a book about our blessed mother appearing to children in Yugoslavia at the time. And uh, I started reading the book and was captivated by it. I was captivated by mir the miracles in it. I was captivated by our blessed mother. And for the first time, I was like, as a young woman myself, I was just in awe of her. She really, she really took hold of my heart. And I remember taught, like, this book was filled with miracle stories and he, like, stories of miraculous healings, stories of people's conversions, stories of families who had, you know, broken families who had reconciled and come back together, great stories of forgiveness. And I remember going to my father one night and saying, dad, like, do miracles like this really happen today? Like, you know, I mean, I know about the stories in the Bible of Jesus walking on water or healing the leper. But at that point in my life as a 16 year old teenage girl, I had never witnessed a miracle in my life that I was aware of. And I didn't know that Jesus worked in people's lives like this. And I remember one night uh, praying for the first time in years, probably I, I finished that book and I got down on my knees one night and I, um, I said a simple prayer to our blessed mother. And I said, Mary, if you're real, like if, if you're real and if your son is real and if your son loves us the way you say he does in this book, then I want to know your son and will you please help me to know him? And I prayed to Hail Mary and I made the sign of the cross and I went to bed. And over the course of the next few weeks, I literally, I had these tangible moments with our blessed mother where I could feel her put her arm around me and whisper into my ear, Larissa, I cannot wait for you to meet my son. He's going to change your life. And there was just these moments and, the, you know, it's, there's a lot to the story and so miracles kind of started happening. And I started, it was like my eyes were open to the first time and all of a sudden our Lord came crashing into my life wow. in some incredibly profound ways. Um, and I started to fall in love with him as a 16 year old girl. Like he just changed my heart. So to make a long story short, I ended up getting confirmed. Not only did I get confirmed that year, I, they asked, I, my confirmation instructor asked me to be, to lecture at that mass. And I felt so honored that I got to lecture at my confirmation mass. And I wish I could say that, you know, in the moment that the bishop confirmed me that I felt this overwhelming sense of the Holy Spirit, not necessarily in that moment, but that night I went home and I couldn't sleep. It was a really warm, it was hot, like hot, uh, late spring evening. And so I went out and I sat on my front porch and I just entered into prayer. Like, I remember looking up at the sky and the stars and sitting there just in awe of what God had done in my life in just a short few months, really a complete 180. And I remember saying to him in that moment, like I looked up at the stars and I thought to myself, God, like if you can do this, if you can create galaxies and the universe and billions of stars in the sky just to dazzle us, then what are you capable of doing in my life? And I remember that moment, just totally giving him everything. I'm like, if you can do all of this and I give you my whole life. And at that moment, I felt a total outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And I knew that I didn't want to live for anything else but him. 
And since then, I mean, there's been highs and there's been lows and there's been dark moments and, and great moments, but it has been the most extraordinary adventure that I can ever imagine. Like, I, I don't know. And I think this is one of the reasons uh, why I love working with teenagers. I was a teenager when I had my conversion. And so I'm passionate about working with teenagers. We are as a couple and it's been probably, you know, I mean, it's been doing in doing youth ministry and campus ministry that we've witnessed so many miracles. I feel like you need to tell the story. Speaking of miracles, she has an incredible story of her dad's. Uh, her dad had a rosary ministry that he started. Um, you need to, I think that'd be a powerful story to share. Like you got to share that story. In the midst of all of this, my dad asked me if I wanted to be, he taught me how to pray the rosary. I didn't know how to pray the rosary up until this point, but then he taught me how to pray the rosary. And he asked me if I wanted to be a part of this rosary ministry with him where he put ads in the paper and people could send us a postcard if they wanted a free rosary. And I remember thinking, who's going to do this? Like, who's going to send us a postcard <laughs> for a free rosary? But sure enough, he put them in papers and news magazines all over the country. And people like every day started, like we had two or three postcards every single day from people asking for a rosary. <laughs> and so I would go to the mailbox, pull it out. We had a little assembly line set up in our garage where, you know, we would package up the rosary and put a little booklet and mail it off. And then we kept a list of everybody's names and we would pray the rosary for them every single night. And one evening or one day, we got a letter from a woman in Vancouver, Washington, or actually Vancouver, Canada. And she said that she had seen the ad, that she wasn't Catholic, wasn't Christian, but her mom was in a coma and she was her, her mother was dying and she didn't know what to do. So she just asked us if we would send her a free rosary. She was just, you know, I think at a, at a place where she was just looking for something. Okay. And so my dad uh, went to our Catholic bookstore, bought some really nice rosaries and a crucifix and a scapular and some holy water. And we sent it off to her and told her that we'd be praying for her and her mom. And we started mm -hmm. praying the rosary for her mom. And a couple weeks later, we got a letter back from her uh, saying that, thanking her for the, you know, thanking us for the rosaries and for the prayers. And she basically told us that she put the scapular on her mom, like my dad had written all of this stuff out, and she put a scapular on the mom, put the crucifix up in the hospital room above her mom's bed. And one evening, the doctors came and said, we don't think your mom's going to make it through the night. Her vitals are dropping. We don't think she's going to make it through. You should get your family together to say goodbye. And so they got the whole family together to say goodbye. And while the kids and the grandkids were all there, she passed out the rosaries that we sent uh, to, the, to her and the booklets. And she said to her family, she said, I know we were not we've never prayed together. I know none of you know how to pray the rosary, but here's this little booklet. And I just would like to ask all of us if we could try to pray this rosary for our mom mm. tonight. Mm. And they prayed, they made it through the rosary. They kind of fumbled through it and they said their goodbyes. Everybody left. The, the daughter that we were corresponding with stayed, got a, uh, got a bed in the hospital room next to her mom. She wanted to be there with her through the night if she were to pass. And when she woke up in the morning, her mom was sitting up in bed and was awake, had come out of the coma. And the doctors were stunned. She basically looked at her daughter and said, can you get me something to eat? I'm really hungry. <laughs> and the doctors released her from the hospital a couple of days later. And the woman wrote to us, and I think what was so profound for me was it said in the letter, Dear George and Larissa, my dad and I, thank you so much for your prayers. Thank you for sending us this. And then she told the story. And she said, obviously, the doctors could not explain what had happened, but I believe it was a miracle. And she said, but I don't, but I believe that even the greater miracle was that that was the first time our family ever prayed together. And I just remember 
well, my dad read me this letter. We were both sitting on the couch together and tears in both of our eyes. And I remember thinking, gosh, this is like one of those miracles in the book. And I can't believe that God allowed me to be a small part of it. That's and wow. truly as a 16 year old girl, it was like, there's nothing better than this, right? And that God wants to use us to be part of those miracles. And he gives us these opportunities. And I just don't think that there's anything better than that, this side of heaven. So thank you for sharing that. I'm glad you brought that up, Johnny. That's, that's incredible. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. All right. I've talked. <laughs> Go ahead. <you> talk. <laughs> Transition. No. Transition. Uh, am I? Well, well, no. <laughs> um, I am uh, born and raised Catholic as well. Cradle Catholic. Um, I consider myself the product of a saintly mom, really. I mean, she, you've met my mom, Eddie. She's, she's just an incredible woman of faith. And I think that I've, I've definitely benefited from her extraordinary faith in my life. Um, my dad has uh, uh, kind of been on his own journey. Of, he was a convert uh, in, into the marriage. So um, really the faith for me um, has, has come through the mom. I know that's not uh, I've heard talks from, you know, the big converts, Scott Hahn, everybody, they give that quote about the mom. If the mom is the one practicing the earth, the dad is the one practicing the faith and most likely the faith will stick. In my case, I was absolutely blessed by, by my mom. So, um, my dad, it wasn't like, it, my dad wasn't ever opposed to the faith. It was it, growing up, uh, you know, he would definitely, say prayers before meals. I always remember that. It just, it wasn't really the most um, important at, for a while there in, in, in his life. But uh, then again, through, through the incredible um, example of my mom, even to him, uh, saintly mom, saintly wife as well, has, has brought him uh, as well in, into a deeper faith today. So I, I've been blessed by that. Um, Wish I could say I always was perfect and lived every single moment of my faith, but that's not the case, as as we all know. Uh, you know, we we are human, unfortunately, and and fall and go through periods of of lukewarmness. And um, sometimes I I've never I've I've always felt that I've had the, uh, a gift of faith. Truly, I, when I look back at my life, I've never not believed in God. That I can't even in my mind I can't even go there. It just doesn't even I can't fathom that. Sure. Um, Definitely went through moments, uh, key moments of deeper uh, faith um, in my life. One of those uh, was, well, I'll start with the, with the first one, uh, was uh, I consider a mentor in my life was my uncle. Uh, and he, uh, he had a farm out in kind of the Twin Falls area. And I remember my brother and I would go visit in the summer. And we would walk around in the morning, either milking cows or irrigating these big old fields or feeding. He had a fish farm. And when, when he would walk, he would just tell, when we would walk with these shovels and do these things out on the farm, he would just tell us these stories of faith. So I, one really impacted me was the story of Fatima. And he started telling me the, the miracle of Fatima and, you know, the sun started to spin 70,000 people. And I, I remember I was in junior high at the time. And I remember thinking to myself, are you kidding me? 70,000 people saw this? This is incredible. And it was less than 100 years ago then. That was back in the 19, uh, you know, 80s uh, that I was in junior high. Uh, so I, I was just blown away. That was That was a really eye-opening moment for me that 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 uh, miracles again here we are that this theme of miracles was happening in such a profound way and the 70,000 people saw it so that always stuck in my mind I I from a from that age tried to tried to develop a relationship with our blessed mother um, again in junior high kind of highs and lows a lot more probably lows than 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 highs um, Probably in my high school, for me, my high school time, the biggest moment for me of faith came in 1993 uh, when Pope John Paul II came to uh, Denver for World Youth Day. And my youth group, my little tiny, small little youth group in Caldwell, Idaho, uh, decided, hey, we're going to get a group together and we're going to take a bus. We're going to go see the Pope. 
Awesome. And I was like, the Pope, okay, yeah, that sounds great. So I remember we did a bunch of uh, raffle tickets. We did all kinds of pancake feeds. We did all kinds of chocolate sales and anything you could think of to make, you know, offset the cost to, to, to do this trip. And, um, and then we went on the trip. And honestly, I can, I can say I, my intentions were not great. You know, my brother, who's less than a year younger than myself, uh, and and my good friend uh, uh, Brock, we we all kind of had the same motive. We're gonna go and meet girls. We're gonna go meet cute girls from all over the country, from all over the world, and probably get their addresses because there was no email back then, or phone numbers would have been weird because there were no cell phones, so you had to call in to your parents' phone. So, yeah, no doubt. So anyway, uh, so we went on that trip, and honestly, I was just a goofy uh, junior in high school, and I'll never forget being up in the very top of Mile High Stadium. It's top of the top you can get the nosebleed. I could literally look off the back of the, the stadium and see, you know, uh, the parking lot. That's how high I was up in, up in the stadium. So I actually got to see uh, Pope John Paul II come in in his helicopter, land outside the stadium and then get into the Pope mobile. And I'll never forget it. It was, it was, it, it had been raining. It had a little bit of lightning here and there, beautiful sunset. Um, and he came in to that stadium and I went from a teenage boy screwing off, slapping hands with my buddies and my brother could, could have cared less to all of a sudden, I don't know what happened to me. I was, literally overcome with emotion wow. to the point where I was like getting all these tears in my eyes and I was <laughs> all these like it was so electric it was incredible to see the Pope come in and in this uh, you know and I I grew up I grew up in uh, you know outskirts of Caldwell and predominantly LDS community sure you know I think my brother and I and my my friend were the only Catholics in our might have been in our school um, so for me to see, first of all, that many Catholics in one place, I was like, holy cow, there's something going on with this Catholic church. And I remember thinking when I was like wiping the tears out of my eyes and trying not to let my friends see that is holy cow, there is something going on here, something much bigger than I had ever dreamed of in my life. And it moved me in such a way that I, it, it was one of those, you know, it propelled me more towards the faith than I had been in a while. Um, so that was, that was an incredible, absolutely incredible moving moment for me. Um, you know, again, wish I could say after that, I was like living the life of sainthood, but uh, you know, in high school and then, and then my college years, as I, as I got into college, my mom started to learn about uh, the Blessed Mother appearing in um, uh, this area in Georgia. It's not an approved apparition, so I, I'm, I don't promote that at all. But for, for us, it was, it was an incredible, uh, another incredible moment of faith. Because when I got into college, I, when I, I remember when I first got into college, I was playing football. And I remember Sunday come up, and I thought to myself, oh, I should go to Mass. Uh, but I've got football. I've got studies. I'll just skip it this week. And then I skipped a couple weeks, skipped probably about a month. And I thought to myself, God, why do I feel so crappy right now? And I remember thinking, like, interior voice, whatever you call it, like, you need to go to Mass. You need to receive the Eucharist. And that was just kind of this thing that hit me in, in, my, in my heart. So um, definitely started going back to Mass in college. And then in, when I was in college, my, this is when my mom started to learn about that apparition. And she said to my dad, you know, I'd really like to go there. And he said, okay. Let's go there for Mother's Day. And um, it was uh, back in the late 90s that we did that. We, we all met in Georgia and went to this incredible, um, there was over 100,000 people in this field uh, where this lady was having these apparitions of the Blessed Mother. One moment I'll never forget is um, uh, we were standing next to some people uh, and they took a picture, a Polaroid. They aimed it up at the sky and they just took a picture and they were um, Latino. So the lady started waving it off, you know, how you had to do that and wait for it to come in. And, and then she looked at it and she started going, 
Ave Maria, Ave Maria, Ave Maria. And I'm like, what, what? And everybody started looking at her picture and freaking out because it was a picture of Mary, like on these cloud things hovering above everybody with her hands extended down towards everyone, kind of like the pictures you see. It was not like one of these ghostly pictures you see on these apparition shows. It was like, if I took a picture of you right now, it was that clear. Wow. And I, and I was like, uh, that was crazy. So one of the main things for, you know, there, they, those apparitions seem to mimic Fatima, you know, convert, pray the rosary. So from that moment forward, we, we began to pray the rosary, you know, as a, as a family. And certainly like my brother and I, even in our dorm room, we would grab the rosary and, and uh, start praying the rosary. So um, that was a big pivotal moment for, for me and my faith. Again, wish I could say that that was, you know, the be all end all of like, I was, you know, living the life of sainthood after that. But, you know, as, as I've explained several times is you have your ups and ups and downs. And um, uh, that was the case as well for me. But um, I started dating a uh, volleyball girl when I was in college. I guess I'll transition into our vocation story. Yes, please. Um, and uh, dated her for four years and thought to myself, well, you know, I, I need to, um, I need to probably, you know, make this a little more official. So ended up proposing to her and she said yes, and we were engaged. And, uh, you know, a little bit of time went by and she broke off the engagement and I was crushed. And I thought, you know, this, this is horrible pain. This is this does not feel good at all. And um, I remember driving around uh, late one night and it was raining. And I remember thinking to myself, I think it would feel better if I just crashed my car into this brick wall. Like I was that distraught that I, I felt, um, you know, such pain that I would, it was such a, an emotional pain. It was, it was almost unbearable at, at that moment. Um, not to mention it didn't help that I saw her you know, with another guy. So like, that didn't help either. But uh, ended up driving around that night, did not crash my car in the wall, which was good. Um, as yeah. fate That's would have funny. it. Yeah. So um, actually ended up it was raining super hard, ended up parking my car on the side of, uh, of the street. And right across from me uh, happened to be where I stopped um, the local Catholic high school in Montana. And in the basement of the Catholic high school, which I had been to many times, uh, was the Adoration Chapel. And I remember kind of being a little bit frustrated with God, like, God, why, why, you know, did this happen? So looking over at the Adoration Chapel, thinking, oh, that's probably the best place I could go, but I just don't really feel like going in there. Um, kind of wrestled with that for a while, ended up going in there. Uh, I was such an emotional mess, though, like as I was going down the stairs into the Adoration Chapel, I was like, I can't go in there right now. I'm gonna distract everybody because I'm such a mess. And so I ended up sitting, there's a, there was a bathroom. This is kind of weird, but just go with it. So there's a, there's a bathroom uh, right next to the Adoration Chapel in the, uh, in the basement of the high school. And um, so I was like, well, I could go in there. That way I won't be distracting everybody inside. And I remember, going in the bathroom, little tiny, small little bathroom, actually sitting down on the stall toilet and um, putting my head on the wall. And on the other side of the wall, I knew Jesus was on the other side of the wall. And I just started sobbing. People in the chapel were probably like, what is going on in the bathroom? And I remember thinking to myself, um, it, it hit me like a bolt of lightning, actually, in that moment when I was with my head on the wall I can still feel what the the wall feels like to this day I can you know what I mean like th those moments are so tangible you can you can actually see it and I remember thinking um I'm not crying I wasn't sobbing because I lost the girl you know she broke up with me it hit me very directly that I had put that girl in front of my relationship with God, with Christ. And so like I made her the number one 
and she should never be there. Nobody should ever be there. Not even your spouse should be there. And so that was a big moment for me. It was a big awakening. And, and I, I knew at that moment I had to start praying and praying deeply of like, where God, God, where are you leading me now? Like, I want to do what you want me to do, no matter what. Like, I want, like, if you want me to be a priest, okay, I'm open to that. If you want me to be a married man, fine, whatever. I just want to do what you want me to do. So in the process of about a year, I started to really pursue God in, in that vocation of what do you want from me? And so um, a house in Boise opened up at that time, which was a house of formation or a house of discernment. And I had been getting phone calls from uh, the rector of that house. His name was Father Hiro at the time, man of incredible spiritual gifts. And he said, would you like to come and live here and discern your vocation um, to the priesthood? And I actually, I had a great job out of college in Montana. And I just said, yeah. I do. And I, I'll never forget like telling my boss, Hey, I am going to quit. They had put a lot of time and effort into me there. And I was like, that was hard, but I was like, I'm going after God. And I want to, I want to do what he wants me to do. And, uh, I, I left, uh, Billings, Montana in, uh, 2000 and one, no, two, 2002 early January. And I headed to Boise to go live in a house with a bunch of other guys thinking and praying about the, uh, the priesthood. So. Next, well, the, the house of discernment was the rectory was the old rectory at the cathedral, which is where I worked. Got it. And that's, and he, uh, father Hiro, uh, introduced Johnny and I, and he wanted, Johnny was going to help with our youth ministry program. And that's how we met. And it was really great because I just thought in my mind that he was going to be heading into the seminary in a couple of months. So it allowed for us to just had, we just had a really great friendship. He helped with our youth ministry program. That was pretty much it. I didn't think anything else of him other than that. I thought he would make a great priest. And um, then obviously I think God had yeah. other plans. Yeah. That. Some uh, unbelievable, miraculous things started happening. And um, I started praying. I'm like, God, because the last thing I wanted again was another relationship. I wasn't, that wasn't on my mind at all. I wasn't like, oh, hey, I'm going to go find a girl in the house of formation for the priesthood. No, I wasn't thinking that at all. I was thinking, God, um, oh, show me your path. What's, what's the path? And I started praying, God, reveal my spouse to me. Whether that, and I wrote all this down. It's in my journal, my prayer journal that I was keeping when I was in. And I said, reveal my spouse to me. Um, uh, I actually, here we are in the year of St. Joseph. I asked St. Joseph, please, St. Joseph, please reveal my spouse to me, whether that is a girl or whether that is the priesthood of the church. Just let me know. I'm open. Just here I am. I, I'm, I'm here. Just let me know. And um, so anyway, I, I, uh, I prayed that prayer like every day, multiple times a day. That was my, my attention. St. Joseph, reveal my spouse to me. And um, it was really interesting because um, making a novena to St. Joseph, like uh, almost every day that I would finish that prayer, all of a sudden she would pop up or she like, and this happened like consecutive days in a row. And I remember thinking after praying that three days in a row and all of a sudden on the third day, I'm literally praying out this third, okay. looking out a third story window and the door, the, the door on Across the parking lot opens and she literally walks right out it when I when I pray the prayer and I remember thinking what is Saint Joseph trying to tell me like Larissa's supposed to be my spouse like this is really weird but like I, I didn't say anything I just kept praying and I went to my spiritual advisor my spiritual advisor said continue to pray he was a holy man very holy man from Africa um, Father Desmond and he would I pour my soul out to him and he go continue to pray and I'd be like that's all you got for me okay but you know what that was the best advice he could have gave me sure because uh, that's what I did and I just continued to pray I'm like well if this is real yeah just continue to pray I don't need to say anything because that'd be weird so time went by I made another novena to St. Therese the little flower who we love 
Uh, she's kind of our, actually our family saint. And um, I had heard that she gives flowers for intentions um, and things. She would send you flowers as confirmation. So I literally wrote down in my prayer journal, St. Therese, I think St. Joseph is trying to tell me, possibly, not sure, but possibly that Larissa is to be my spouse. And I literally said, if that is true, could you please confirm that? I hear you send roses. That would be great. End of the prayer. So I did that every day. And I remember thinking for nine days, and I remember thinking uh, to myself on the last day of that novena, God, this is so dumb. What am I doing? Like, I am like in the formation center to be a priest, a priesthood. And here I am like so sidetracked. What I'm like thinking about this girl um, who I just had a working relationship with. Because one of the things when you lived in the house, you had to work in a ministry in the church. So I chose youth ministry. So, um, so anyway, that was, I, I remember that last day, uh, I was actually working at a, you also had to have a, a job and I was working at a local local business in the morning early early in the morning like 5 a.m uh maybe six and i was reading the prayer for the last time thinking god so dumb what am i doing i'm making this stuff up in my head i just need to stay focused go to the seminary what did i do wrong i probably did something wrong all these thoughts going through my head right and i'm like oh i know what i did wrong i remember on the the third day of the prayer, I heard somebody say you could literally ask for a color of a rose. So I originally just thought red would be nice. And then I specifically asked for white. And I was like, that's probably what I did. I messed up. I, I totally bombed this novena. <laughs> what am I doing anyway? I'm like having all these weird thoughts in my head. What am I doing anyway? <laughs> so anyway, as I'm like looking down at the novena prayer, thinking about like messing it up thinking about like saint joseph if larissa's or you know saint therese if larissa's to be my spouse send me the roses this person walks through the door sets some roses on the desk never saw them never saw them to this day and i'm reading the prayer sets them on this desk that i was stationed at turns around and leaves i literally look up from the prayer and it's a dozen white roses with one red rose in the middle of it. And I thought, what? what? And so then kind of like, a um, little bit of panic set into me. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is, a, this is an answer. Like this is, to me, that was my, my gift, my sign directly from St. Therese. That, yeah, she's to be your, your spouse. And um, then I thought, uh-oh. How do I go and tell a girl like, hey, um, you're supposed to be my spouse. Like that would be weird. And like in my head, I thought I can't do that because that would be manipulation. And these people that do that really bother me. I got to take a commercial break here. Yeah. But when people when people pray about something and then they tell somebody I got all these signs and those that person never got any confirmation for that. That's almost like I find that manipulating, to be honest. Like so I thought to myself, I'm in, oh, my gosh. I can't say anything to her. If this is real, I'm like, God, you have to put that on her heart. So I'm like, well, I went back to my spiritual advisor and I told him all this and you can guess what he said to me. Continue right. to pray. That's what he said to me. And I thought, okay, that's a good idea. So I started making a novena to the Holy Spirit. And I'm like, okay, Holy Spirit. And it was leading up to Pentecost and I'm like, or close to it. And I, and I had never made a novena to the Holy Spirit before ever. Um, and I remember thinking, if this is real, I can't, I can't say anything. I literally wrote down in my journal, if this is for real, what St. Joseph is telling me, what St. Therese has confirmed, the Holy Spirit, then you have to make that so overwhelming in her heart that she can't basically stand it anymore. And she, we have to talk about it. So I was like, I'm going to like seal, I'm sealed. I can't say anything. I'm like, let the Holy Spirit do it. So. I did that and made a novena to the Holy Spirit. Maybe that's where you should take mm -hmm. over. I, I guess like. Yeah. <laughs> well, basically I, um, 
we were just, you know, friends. I really didn't see him outside of youth ministry. We didn't hang out together, nothing like that. I didn't really think about him a whole lot. I just, other than that, he was one of my, one of the core members on our team. Um, but then uh, towards the end of, you know, middle of May of that year, I, we, we went on a retreat and I started to kind of just have, I started finding myself having feelings for him and thinking, oh my gosh, what am I doing? This guy is going to the seminary. I cannot have feelings for him. So I really like just tried to create some boundaries, like make sure I was kind of stayed away from him. And uh, he came to my office one day. He had gone through his, uh, the priest, he had to go through a bunch of psychological tests and evaluations. And we were talking and. Truth is, I failed. No. <laughs> that explains, that that explains, explains a lot. Oh my gosh. <laughs> now I understand. <laughs> What the heck? And uh, I remember him, you know, we were kind of having this conversation and he said something to me like, do you think I would make a good priest or, or something like that? And I remember thinking in my mind, like, yes, I think you would be a great priest. But there was like something in me that I was like, no, but don't go to the seminary. I need to tell you like how I'm feeling. And I, um, was just, I was I was having these overwhelming feelings for him. And I remember actually saying to him, I literally run to the bathroom. I went to the bathroom and I was like, what am I'm like, I that was weird. <laughs> and I came back and kind of tried to blow it off. He ended up leaving that day. And I thought that might be the last day our youth ministry had wrapped up for the year. I knew he was going to be going home for the summer. And I thought, and then he was going to be going off to the seminary. And I remember thinking, what if this is the last time I see him? And it was just so overwhelming. I had written in my journal, God, why is this so overwhelming? What is going on? Why am I having these feelings for this man that would be an amazing priest? And um, anyways, I ended up feeling so convicted in my heart that I at least needed to share with him what I was feeling. Um, just so I could have peace with it. Knowing that he would probably be like, okay, I, yeah, I'm not interested. I'm headed to the seminary, but then I could have peace with it. So I ended up calling him up. We went for a hike up to Table Rock and basically ended up kind of just sharing what was going on in our hearts. He didn't share any of the Novena stuff with me. Uh -huh. And I'm really grateful at the time that he didn't because it just allowed for us to develop a, a deeper friendship. And then um, eventually he left the house of formation and we started to date and then we got engaged and I mean, then like, that's kind of the story, but do you want to talk about Father Hiro? Oh, Father Hiro, the, the rector of the house, um, he's an incredible man. A um, lot of amazing spiritual gifts that he has. And um, I remember I thought, I, I got to tell Father Hiro, after we went up to Table Rock on that hike and we had talked, you know, I said to her, I, I said, hey, I just want to talk to you about something. I, I been praying a lot and you keep coming up in a lot of my prayers is anything like that happening to you so I didn't go into any of the truly miraculous stuff um and she said yeah and that's why I wanted to come up here and I'm like okay so I knew I had to I had a decision I had to make I have to like go forward from here and you know date I have to date her and um so I went I knew Father Hiro I was like in my head, I'm like, he wants me to be a priest so bad. He's like, oh, geez. Like, I'm like dreading it. I'm like, I got to talk to Father Hiro. So I prayed like a lot and um, for the right moment to, to talk to him. And I found him, uh, he was up in the lounge of the house one, one afternoon and he was um, watching TV. And I went up there and I said, hey, hey, Father, can I talk to you? And he goes, yes, Johnny, I'm going to do the Colombian accent that he does. And he's like, that was perfect. Oh, of course. And uh, so anyway, I started talking to him and telling him the story that I just told you. And I said, um, I was all done. And I was like, he's going to be mad because he worked with Larissa and he worked, you know, he's, he was with me and I'm like, oh, he's going to be mad at her. Like, you know, for taking a seminary and away from the priesthood. But like yeah. he actually, when I got, when I finished my story and telling him all the things that were happening, he goes, Johnny, if the saints in heaven are interceding for you in such an extraordinary way like that, you would be a fool not to follow that. And I said, yeah, I go, that's what I thought, Father. And I said, um, 
I just have to tell you one other thing. And he goes, what? And I go, I need to tell you who the girl is. And he, he literally looks down for a minute, looks up, smiles, and he goes, Johnny, I already know. And I go, what? And he goes, I knew this from the very beginning. Wow. I knew, I knew this. This was the reason that you were coming here. I'm like, what? what? Why didn't you say anything? He goes, because, I didn't, because you needed to discover this for yourself. And that was kind of like the last big confirmation, you know, like, yeah. Yeah, he told, he told us, well, he told Johnny at the time, me later on, uh, after months later, but he said, before Johnny even came to the house, he had had a vision of celebrating our wedding. What? Yeah. Which he did. He did. <laughs> he celebrated our wedding. Yeah. Wow. So, Great. yeah, that's... Jeez. It's 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 an incredibly extraordinary, um, very blessed uh, uh, story. I want to say real. I mean, real life. The thing that I always want to make sure that people know is like God also works in the ordinary. Um, is many times I don't want people thinking, well, I met my spouse in a bar. Like I'm really, you know, like if that's where you met your spouse, then that was where you're supposed to meet your spouse. So I don't want anybody thinking like, oh, well, like, I, I mean, honestly, it, it was an incredible, incredible gift. Um, the way that, that God, you know, introduced us. So, um, when we we're definitely thankful for that and we recognize just that, that it was an extraordinary gift. Wow. So. Thanks for sharing that guys. Mm -hmm. I had no Thank idea. You. I had no idea how much, uh, how many miracles were involved in your story. Yeah. Um, there's one thing I wanted to maybe shift gears and talk about before you guys go. Uh, you have so much experience with youth. I was wondering if you could talk about whether this is something that has happened over the past five years or is happening this current year. Can you just talk a little bit about what you're seeing in youth now, whether you're sharing miracles, things that they struggle with. I know that people that will find this video when they hear youth, youth day and youth ministry, a lot of these people will be parents. And anyway, I don't know if, you, if you're following what I'm talking about, but just any, anything you can share about the current state of the youth or what you've seen in your various programs, that would be helpful. Sir, I think that, uh... You know, I, I teach at a high, Catholic high school, so I'm with teenagers every day. Then we do youth ministry on the weekends. And I think sometimes as adults, we can underestimate the depth that our young people are willing to go and that they're longing to go in their faith life. I have, it seems to me that the more I'm willing to, or the more we're willing to be really honest, vulnerable, share with them the depth of God's love. They want to go there. Yeah. And that they're longing to hear miracle stories. They're longing to hear how God is working in people's lives, sharing testimonies and conversions and really learning the truth, the beauty and the goodness of our Catholic faith. I think sometimes as adults, when it comes to, to children, teenagers, we want to keep it at a surface level entertain them or keep it light and I think that young people are just like us like they have this deep longing in their heart for truth and the more we're willing to give it to them the more they're willing to to receive it and then they start asking the questions and when you're really willing to engage and to go there and to trust that they actually can have a depth of maturity to them. That's good. Yeah. It, it like elevates it. Like it, 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 it acknowledges their dignity as God's beloved children. And I think we, you know, and we have, we're always amazed even with our own children at the depths of conversations that we're capable of having with them and the questions that they have, even when they're like nine and 10 years old, but so often we just think we underestimate like, oh, they wouldn't be interested in that or that wouldn't, you know, but they are. And I think especially right now, uh, like in our youth group, it's in our youth group, it's not a requirement for confirmation to come. We just have kids coming 
and they're showing up and they're diving into the small group discussions and into the prayer. And I just, I'm really been in awe. I think that especially with everything going on in the world, they're, they want to hold on to something that is real and beautiful and not fleeting. Mm-hmm. They want, mm-hmm. they want God. Yeah. We all do. We want him so badly and only he can fill the, the deepest longings of our hearts. So the other thing that I am a huge, we are huge proponents of is teaching the faith through the lives of the saints. Sure. I, I think we have such an extraordinary wealth uh, of, of faith and knowledge from the saints. You know, John Paul II said, God speaks to us through the lives of the saints. And when you can tell a story uh, of a saint, their age, like a blessed Jose Sanchez del Rio, who was a, a little, you know, 14, when he... 14 year old boy mm-hmm. who just had extraordinary zeal and courage that, that, you know, that you can put that example in front of those, those young people, you know, or a, or a St. Maria Goretti or a, or a blessed Pier Giorgio Fersati. Holy cow. I mean, or, or blessed Carlo who was, you know, yeah. yeah. Oh Yeah. Yeah, and more modern, you know, or 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 blessed Chiara Luce Bendano. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I we we are huge fans of teaching the the youth um, about the saints and and those examples that go before us. And they, you know, it's like us. We look at sports heroes. We look at mo- people. Look at movie stars or whatever your idol is. It's like we look to the saints, man. They are incredible. What an extraordinary plethora of yes knowledge that we have there so so true yeah get get your kids teenagers good books good catholic there's so many resources get them onto some of these cool websites and you know let them dive deeper into their faith but i was really grateful for my father who was willing to share his faith with me and get me excited about it obviously our blessed mother um was so instrumental in both of our lives at a young age and so i always tell my teenagers that i work with just just run to mary and the eucharist of course i mean that's that's jesus we you know of course i'll never forget the first youth conference that we were in charge of it we we took it over and the big thing before we took it over was this dance that was the highlight of the weekend and it was to secular music and kids were doing the dances that they do it any public school dance or anywhere. Sure. And we said, we want to remove the dance and we're going to put adoration in that moment. And they said, uh, okay, well, that's not going to work. You can do that, but it's not going to work. So we did it. And it was the most extraordinary, incredible experience I, I've ever seen in my life. Like we had kids on their knees, their hands reaching out, tears coming down, Jesus going through literally you know the 1600 kids that we had that first uh conference that we did and it it was like you you could have heard a you could have heard a pin drop if you could have you know heard it through you know the sniffling and the crying and the and the praising god it was incredible wow you know so they were they were that hungry so the eucharist is don't 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 think oh this is boring and i mean our faith is anything but boring. And I actually feel like it's a sin. We talk about this a lot. It's a sin to make the faith boring because it's not. It's not at all. In any, in any way. So. Yeah. Wow. Yes. We want to, we want to bring our young people into an encounter with Christ. Yeah. And then we want to, then we get out of the way. We yeah. let him do what he does, which is the heart changing, life changing, soul changing work. And, and then, you know, we just feel like we get to have front row seats to watch him do what he does. Guys, I might have to have you back on, actually. We can talk more about saints and youth. I think it's just such a, whew, it's such an important topic right now. So, um, yeah, keep up the good work. That was exceptional. I appreciate you both. And, um, yeah, I'll be in touch. So maybe we can do, maybe we can do this again. That would be, that would be fun. So. Be great. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for this Eddie. opportunity, Eddie. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for all you do. Yeah. My, my pleasure. So everyone, thank you so much for watching this episode. 
I again remind you to subscribe, let others know. I, I'm going to keep filling the hopper, so to speak, with testimonies, and hopefully we can get, you know, 50, 60 episodes this, this year alone. So uh, with that, take care and God bless. Bye.